So we ended the last video uh, recording looking at um, a couple ways that hydrogen ion concentration increases in the lumen um, so that uh, there's an establishment of a hydrogen ion gradient which is high concentration of hydrogen ions in the lumen and low in the, in the stroma and that's ultimately going to um, drive ATP synthesis. So it's valuable to take a moment to compare um, what's happening between non-cyclic electron flow and cyclic electron flow. So when uh, we're looking at non-cyclic electron flow, that's when we have electrons moving through photosystem two, um, through the thylakoid membrane as plastoquinone, um, through the cytochrome B6F complex, uh, transferred to plastocyan and, in, and into um, photosystem one to ferrodoxin to produce NADPH. So a cyclic electron flow, remember, sort of bypasses some of that, um, th that flow where ferrodoxin then uh, reduces plastoquinone again instead of uh, NADP plus. And then um, plastoquinone can then enter the, the plastoquinone reduced oxidized pool again. Uh, and in its reduced form can be reoxidized at cytochrome, thereby shuttling a couple more um, hydrogen ions across. So to sort of complete, uh, to make a comparison between the two, um, in, in non-cyclic electron flow, we do have hydrogen ions accumulating in the lumen, uh, either from hydrolysis of water or from the transport of hydrogen ions across the thylakoid membrane by plastoquinone. So we can go ahead and uh, confirm that that happens. Uh, as a result, ATP synthesis will res um, occur. Um, oxygen is produced when, hydro when water is oxidized or hydrolysis of water occurs by photosystem 2. So we can confirm that occurs. And then here at the end of non-cyclic electron flow, NADPH is produced. Now when we compare that with cyclic electron flow, we see that again, the whole idea here is to continue to increase the hydrogen ion concentration in the lumen. So we do have hydrogen ion transport um, into the lumen and as a result ATP synthesis occurs. Um, oxygen production, is that happening in cycl cyclic electron flow? And we're looking at just the red line features here. We can see that there's no inclusion of electrons coming from photosystem two. And so oxygen production um, does not occur as a result. And also we are excluding ferrodoxin from um, reducing NADP+, plus, which means NADPH is not going to be produced. So these last two uh, items here do not occur in cyclic electron flow. All right, so remember the benefit of, select, of cyclic electron flow is ultimately um, to produce ATP. And we, the plant needs mo basically more ATP um, in the Calvin cycle than NADPH. It also uses ATP for other processes in the, in the chloroplast. Now, both non-cyclic electron flow and cyclic electron flow are occurring simultaneously at all times um, for the most part. So um, it's not that we see, uh, you know, a switching back and forth, but because of the distribution of these, proton, of these protein complexes throughout the thylakoid membranes, they're occurring simultaneously. All right, so the, the type of ATP synthesis that occurs from cyclic electron flow, we, we refer to as cyclic <clears throat> photophosphorylation and the type of ATP synthesis that occurs as a result of non-cyclic electron flow is referred to as uh, linear or non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Okay, so make sure you're familiar with um, these, this terminology. Okay, so non-cyclic electron flow results in non-cyclic or linear photophosphorylation. Cyclic electron flow results in uh, cyclic photophosphorylation. So now if we look back at our overall diagram here on the left, um, we can see all the places where hydrogen ions are accumulating in the lumen. Um, things that are not included in this diagram include the, the Q cycle and, uh, of course, cyclic um, linear, cyclic electron flow. 
uh, but ultimately to accumulate all these different uh, hydrogen ions, different numbers uh, accumulating here, which then is used by the ATP synthase to produce ATP. And down here on the right, we just have a, di a um, molecular structure for ATP, reminding ourselves here that adenosine is a um, nitrogenous base that makes up ATP. Uh, there's a sugar ribose group here, and then three phosphate groups. So um, the third phosphate group has um, bonded to the uh, second one has a high level of energy that is used to, tr to transfer to other molecules um, that are involved in either active transport or in this, in this case the Calvin cycle. So just to kind of um, do have a um, to sort of take a step back from our um, dissection of the of the light reactions and the resulting NADPH and ATP production, uh, it's helpful to to take a look at um, back at light and how light affects these light reactions and photosynthesis overall. So on the right we have a diagram of um, well on both diagrams we have our. Um, what we call photosynthetic light response curves, which you can see titled up here. And on the x-axis we have a radiance level which is measured in the units micromoles of photons per meter square per second. So this is our photosynthetically active radiation from zero to somewhere in here at about 2,000. Um, micromoles of photons per meter square per second. And on the y-axis we have the photosynthesis rate, which in this case is measured in oxygen production. But remember, our photosynthesis rate can be also measured in uh, CO2 consumption. Depending on the, the, um, the uh, analyzer that's sensing which, whichever of those molecules is present uh, in a closed chamber s surrounding the leaf. So uh, at what we see in, in this part of the curve is um, you can see this straight line gives us a slope so that as light intensity or radiance increases photosynthesis increases. So we, we would say that this part of the curve is the, the light limited parted part of the cur curve meaning that um, the lower the light level the lower the photosynthesis. Okay. Um, and we refer to this part of the curve as photosynthetic efficiency, which um, is not actually on the other, the right hand figure either. Photosynthetic efficiency is the slope of this part of the curve. And photosynthetic efficiency basically equals um, the number of, mo of micromoles of CO2 consumed or oxygen uh, produced per photon of light. Now presumably the, the more light that comes in the higher the photosynthesis because this is where the light reactions are um, functioning producing ATP and NADPH which are then going to just be passed on to the Calvin cycle and we'll be looking at more, the Calvin cycle in more detail here in just a minute. Um, but then you can see where this um, photosynthesis rate starts to level off and where it levels off here it is um, basically it's no long, it's not light limited this is not a light limited region of the curve. LIM. It's um, instead, this is um, where the part of the curve that is limited by the Calvin cycle reactions. So, for example, the CO2 level, <coughs> as we'll see, the um, the level of the of the CO2 acceptor molecule, RUBP, or the enzyme that uh, catalyzes CO2 fixation, which is Rubisco. Um, so all of these are possible components that are going to start limiting the level of um, photosynthesis. And so we refer to this region of the curve as photosynthetic capacity, the maximum photosynthesis level that's, that's possible. And so you just take that straight curve and come back to the y-axis and determine what its maximum uh, photosynthesis rate is. Okay. 
What we also might note here down at the bottom of the curve is the light compensation point uh, shown right in this area. So um, it's, it's interesting to note that the, the curve here in the light limited region uh, reaches zero photosynthesis bef um, with some amount of light present. In other words, it doesn't require that we get down to a zero level of um, light intensity or photosynthetically active radiation. And so at light compensation point, um, is, w is basically when photosynthesis rate equals respiration rate. So the, the production of CO2 equals the production or the consumption of CO2 between these two processes. And then of course below the light compensation rate um, point rather, then we're looking at uh, respiration all in here. Looking back at this, um, our notes here in this curve, um, I just want to make a correction on the units that we're looking at here, which is micromoles of CO2 um, per photon to measure photosynthetic efficiency. So um, we measure photon flux or density in micromoles um, per meter square per second. We measure CO2 consumption as micromoles per meter square per second as well. Um, other uh, clarification, just to make sure we've got our understanding of uh, photosynthetic capacity here. Uh, remember, ATP and NADPH, uh, or at least ATP is going to, both of them actually, are ultimately going to be important for the synthesis of the CO2 acceptor um, RUBP, which we'll see shortly. And so photosynthetic capacity is simply where um, that part of the curve that is limited by these Calvin cycle functions, for example, that there isn't enough RUBP or enough Rubisco um, to accept all the carbon dioxide molecules present. So RUBP regeneration or saturation of Rubisco enzyme could end up basically um, dropping the, you know, limiting the maximum photosynthesis rate here. So we can match up some of the things that we talked about with this figure over here. And one of the things that we can see in this figure uh, that's added is this section of the curve right here, which uh, is listed as photooxidation. And photooxidation results uh, when light intensity is, so is to a high enough point. You can see above 2,000 here, um, micromoles per meter square per second, where there isn't a lo enough light reaction machinery to um, either to dissipate that or harness that excess energy. And so this can lead to what we refer to as um, photo inhibition, photo inhibition, which is when we have excess um, energy that gets, uh, th that excites other molecules that are not intended to be excited. And as a result, we see uh, this uh, drop off in photosynthesis rate. So, um, so some of the uh, light uh, uh, tr electron transport machinery, light reaction machinery, ha becomes damaged. So we'll take a few notes on that topic. So photo inhibition is basically defined as oxidative damage to uh, lipids, proteins, pigments, uh, perhaps the oxygen evolving complex, the D1 protein, um, due to excess absorption of light energy. And so in the next video clip, we'll look at ways that the plant can respond to um, minimize and repair damage as resulting from photo inhibition.